Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. And welcome back to Below Average Potato, once again, for it is he. Although he's not alone, he's divisioned up with a couple of his friends. We've got SFNL in the American Tier 10 light cruiser, the Worcester. And we've got WD Spuds in the Japanese Tier 10 battleship, the Yamato. This is of course a Tier 10 arms race battle, although there are some tier 9s and tier 8s present. Below average Potato himself is in the Pan-Asian tier 10 destroyer, the Lucian. This is a Chinese take on the, well it technically is and technically isn't a Chinese take on the Russian uh, Project 41 destroyer. China did build Project 41 destroyers, uh, but not when they first got their hands on the blueprints. They sort of ummed and awed about it a bit, and then eventually they built Project 41 missile destroyers, which this obviously isn't. This is the actual Project 41 destroyer that China didn't build, but which is here under the Chinese flag in World of Warships. Didn't build. <laughs> didn't build. I forgot how to speak English there for a moment. Anyway, Lushun basically has exactly the same hull as the Neustrashimi, just with slightly worse concealment. She does have excellent concealment though. You can see that Below Average Potato has managed to get the surface detection of this thing down to 5.8 kilometers. It's not quite the best in the game, but it's still pretty bloody good. She's not terribly fast, however, with a base top speed of only 36 knots, which at tier 10 is distinctly pedestrian for a destroyer. This is actually kind of a dangerous combination because the excellent stealth is going to encourage you to perhaps get closer to your enemies than you can safely handle. Because if you get counter spotted in return, you're not fast enough to break contact and you don't have a smoke screen. Fortunately, in this battle, there are no aircraft carriers to spot you from above. There are also no submarines. Uh, there are, however, at least two radars on the enemy team. Good old battleship Moskva and the American tier nine cruiser, the USS Buffalo. The thing is, if you do find yourself in a surprise close-range engagement that you're not fast enough to get out of, and you don't have a smoke screen to hide in, you do have other tools at your disposal. Oh look, he's just gotten himself into a surprise close-range engagement that he's not fast enough to get out of, and he doesn't have a smoke screen to hide in. But he does have some of the most stupidly fast-firing guns imaginable. Look at this. He's only got two turrets. Two guns for turret, but I mean... Would you just... Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was a Yugamo. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> oh, the team have just lost their Katsonas. Okay, so... Uh, you know, it's even Stevens. Both teams have lost the Destroyer. Uh, and how much damage did... Yeah, basically none. Full health to dead in seconds. Rip Yugamo. And it cost him basically nothing. Oh, and if you do take damage as a result of not being able to disengage or hide, um, this ship also gets heavy repair teams. What the hell are heavy repair teams? I'm not surprised if you haven't heard of them. Uh, they were a consumable type that was unique to the Russian Sevastopol cruiser, but which you now also get on the Pan-Asian Lucian. Uh, basically, it's a repair team that repairs more, although it does have a longer cooldown. It also lasts longer, because it doesn't actually repair anything any faster, but it is repairing more. So it works longer and has a longer cooldown, but does repair a lot more hit points. That heavy repair team, in combination with the, the decent 23,000 hit points that the Lucian has, means that this is actually the tier 10 destroyer with the biggest effective health pool. Uh, you know, all useful stuff when you only have a top speed of 36 knots and you don't have a smoke screen. But of course as a Pan-Asian destroyer, the one other thing that it gets is deep water torpedoes. So for the benefit of those of you who may be new here, deep water torpedoes are, well, they're torpedoes that travel deep. The clue's kind of in the title. What this means in practical terms is that they're torpedoes that cannot hit destroyers. And for some reason also can't hit submarines. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I know, I know, they can't hit destroyers because they travel too deep under the water and they just pass harmlessly underneath shallow draft vessels like destroyers. But then why can't they hit some, don't ask, it's just, 
well, it's just wargaming things. Anyway, um, this basically means that it's armed with torpedoes that can only hit cruisers, battleships, or aircraft carriers. So, deep water torpedoes, by default, do tend to do more damage. I mean, that's the benefit that you get for not being able to use them against destroyers or submarines. Um, and he has missed the Yamato with them. Almost certainly, however, not because the Yamato saw the torpedoes coming, because that's one of the other special things about the Lushan. Uh, while the deep water torpedoes that this thing's armed with, oh, and Spud and the Yamato's just gotten himself a kill, nailing yet another enemy destroyer, the French Tier 10 Claudaire. But while the deep water torpedoes on the Lushan are basically very similar to most other Pan Asian deep water torpedoes, they've got good range, good damage, they're well, they're not fast, but they're definitely not slow. The ones fired by the Lushan have best in class stealth. They're next to impossible to see coming unless you have hydro running. I mean, deep water torpedoes in general are very stealthy, but the Lushans are extremely stealthy. Oh, both teams are down two destroyers, I missed that. And the enemy Illinois has just sunk the Santander, giving the enemy team a very brief one kill advantage, which doesn't last long as below average potatoes. Other division mate, SFNL in the Worcester, obliterates the enemy gearing, uh, who was almost certainly radared in his smokescreen over there. So the enemy team are now down to one destroyer, the Shimakaze. So the scores are holding even at 440 points each. Both teams have lost three ships. And there are no cap circles to worry about because this is arms race. Or at least there are no cap circles yet. In arms race, once a certain period of time has elapsed, and right now there's only a minute and 47 seconds to go before it happens, one central cap circle will appear right in the middle of the map. And whoever controls that is pretty much going to win the game because you'd start generating a ridiculous amount of points every second. The thing is, in arms race, that cap circle then starts to shrink. It gets smaller and smaller as the battle goes on, forcing both teams into closer and closer quarters in order to try to flip, or at the very least, contest it. Oh, and Spuds in the Yamato's managed to get himself another kill, taking out the enemy Bismarck. So the team are now up two kills, 470 points to 390. Remember, there are no points coming in for control of cap circles. Not for at least another minute. Spud stalking the Yamato there. He's gotten one set of torpedoes away. These torpedoes have a nearly 11 kilometer range. Speed of 65 knots. And as already mentioned, they are incredibly difficult to spot. The Yamato spider sense is tingling though. He's launched his spotter plane. That might give him some early warning. Oh, speaking of getting spotted, we have found the enemy Shimakaze. He opens up with his guns, which is unusual for a Shimakaze captain, but good. The Shimakaze's guns have very high alpha damage, even if they don't have a great reload. They're absolutely not going to beat this reload. Hydro popped because obviously the Shimakaze is going to have launched torpedoes, but he has not launched all of them. That's only two of his three launchers. Sure enough, here come the second set of torpedoes. The Shimakaze is, of course, absolutely doomed. Spud does actually take a hit there from the Yamato, and it's a fairly big hit, but he manages to land three deep water torpedoes of his own, and with the narrow width of this thing, is fairly comfortably able to thread the needle between the tracks of the last set of five torpedoes launched by the Shimmer. Now, those three torpedo hits have left the Yamato really hurting, and we know he's used his damage control because a flood was inflicted and it is not ticking over. So Spud's aim now is obviously to set a fire before the Yamato can recover too much health. And there's the fire. Is this going to be a kill? Oh, the team have just lost their Frederick the Great. Can't focus on that right now. Oh, those of you who are watching this in a device with high enough resolution to be able to read chat, probably if you didn't catch it the first time it happened, there's a very, very frank and open exchange of views going on between the uh, the friendly Kleber player. He was not happy with the uh, Shimakaze captain, the below average potato just sunk. Probably because he was in a Kleber and he lost a gunfight to a Shimakaze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be quite upset too, but not with the Shimakaze. Right, anyway, you notice he switched to the armor piercing shells to deal with Battleship Moskva over there. Uh, Moskva is very, very heavily armoured for a cruiser. 
and these low caliber high explosive shells would basically do nothing. The armor piercing on the other hand is doing a reasonable job. Oh, there's some large caliber high explosive coming in. That's probably the St. Vincent. Yep, that did a lot of damage. Almost certainly not going to be the Moskva. Moskva captains never load high explosive. Their HE shells are terrible. The Moskva's guns aren't even pointing this way. Since the Moskva is basically just sitting there, though, the deep water torpedoes are going to finish him off. He needs to nail that St. Vincent before he does this again. Oh, he's got the Moskva. And the St. Vincent's return shots missed. St. Vincent's angling in now. Might want to start thinking about switching to the high explosive shells. Unlike the Moskva, as a battle cruiser, the St. Vincent's armor isn't that good. Oh, taken out by Spuds in the Yamato. That's both Spuds in the Yamato and below average potato in the Lucian on three kills apiece. SFNL in the Worcester still on one kill, the gearing that he nailed earlier on. The enemy Hindenburg's just taking care of the friendly Kansas, but we're still ahead on kills pretty comfortably and still also ahead on points. Although, SFNL looks like he's losing a lot of health over there. Oh, and he's dead. Taken out by the Hindenburg, who is now on three kills of his own, as Below Average Potato continues to rain down high explosive death and destruction on this. Yamato getting himself another fire eventually. Took you long enough. Yamato's almost certainly got his damage control and probably his repair party ready to go again, however. Probably, if he has any sense, and he doesn't seem to be stupid, he's saving the uh, damage control. Oof, that hurt. Probably saving the damage control for a double fire. Illinois just managed to get himself another kill, taking down the Harlem. And that's a lot of enemy ships who suddenly appear to be pointing their guns in this direction. So below average potato decides, yep, that's quite enough, thank you. He's got that heavy repair party working, he's going to wait to go undetected. Holy shit, look at this. That's one hell of a nasty crossfire. Oh! <laughs> yeah. yeah, you might want to rely on the torpedoes for a while. Uh, give that heavy repair party time to do its thing. Oh, and don't forget, because this is arms race, uh, the teams have managed to pick up passive heals, which are also ticking those health points back up. Uh, making it even more important that you get an enemy on low health and you finish him off. Like Spuds in the Yamato finishing off the enemy Atago. That's his fourth kill. Good job. Below average potato, feeling confident that the remaining enemy ships, well with the exception of the buffalo here that he's raining down armor piercing on, have had enough time to turn their guns elsewhere at other targets. He's uh, this is a dangerous game. I mean, he should probably get the buffalo. He did get the buffalo. <laughs> but... Uh, not before the Buffalo got a second return high explosive salvo off, but actually that was a fairly cheap price to pay. And of course because the Buffalo was the only one inside detection range the second he nailed him, taking out an enemy radar in the process, he once again managed to go undetected. But below average potato is done pussying around, he's going for the Illinois. Oh and the Illinois and his guns are like, whoa, and he's got the high explosive loaded too, oh, this could be bad. Actually, this is very brave take. Well, it's not, because Spuds and the Yamato has nailed the Illinois, claiming his Kraken Unleashed and his fifth kill. But the Illinois, what makes that thing special is, yes, it's a battleship, but it's got the Des Moines guns. Yes, those terrifying, rapid-firing 8-inch guns, rather than 14, 15, or 16-inch battleship guns, making it extremely dangerous to take on in the Destroyer. But it basically had no health left, so this is fine team have not yet, but are about, to take that central cap, and they're already 440 points ahead, with the enemy team down to 110 points. That poor old Yamato, <laughs> I mean, he's been playing a good game. Actually, there are several ships on the enemy team that have been playing a good game. Uh, the Illinois, who's now dead. The Hindenburg, who's still alive, but not for long. And the Yamato over there. And below average potato was once again proving to be a massive thorn in the Yamato's side. But the Yamato's biting back. He knows that below average potato is the biggest threat. He knows that he's lurking around. Spuds and the Yamato finishes off the Hindenburg. That just leaves the enemy Yamato. The enemy team are now down to 40 points. I guess it doesn't really matter if uh, below average potato dies here. They've got the central cap circle. There is absolutely no way that Yamato is going to win. It's all just a question of who's going to get the kill. And it's going to be... Drum roll. We're not actually doing a drum roll. <laughs> Guys hanging on and refusing to die. 
Come on, somebody get him. And it's below average potato, getting his own Kraken Unleashed and his fifth kill, as well as the Arsonist Award and securing victory. Good battle. But the thing about this battle that you may not have noticed is just exactly who got the kills. Below average potato obviously just scored a crack and unleash, finishing off the last enemy ship, that very unfortunate Yamato. So five kills for him, which ended up being worth more than 3,000 base experience. So well done to him. And also well done to WD Spuds in the friendly Yamato, who didn't get quite as much base experience, but got one more kill. Six in total, finishing off the enemy Hindenburg towards the end of the battle there. And the final kill was scored by SFNL in the Worcester. That gearing that he absolutely obliterated early on in the battle. So who else on the team got any kills? That would be nobody. <laughs> this division of three ships. Below Average Potato in the Lushan, WD Spuds in the Yamato, and SFNL in the Worcester destroyed, between them, the entire enemy team. That's not something you see every day, but thanks to Below Average Potato, WD Spuds and SFNL, you've just seen it today. And I hope you've enjoyed it, because that's it. Thank you and well done to all three of today's victorious team carriers. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.